Hello, welcome to Oh That's Good, the show or the conversation or whatever the heck this is in which I talk to people who are experts about something, some topic, could be any topic, and they share with me a little bit of their expertise about something that brings them great pleasure, perhaps even joy, and they help me appreciate it. Today I am talking to Siobhan Dougal. She is an old friend of mine. Uh, she's a coworker. She's been working with me on uh, a, a product, a piece of software called QLab for many years now. Uh, and I am cheating this time around a little bit because I specifically asked her to talk about something that she has talked to me about before. Uh, and so I do know a little bit about the topic we're going to talk about. Yeah, I'm, I'm cheating. Cheater. But it's, I will, because I have a terrible memory, uh, I've forgotten most of the details of what we're going to talk about. And so I'm going to be on this journey with you. Even though I've heard this before, I'm going to be on the journey with you again today. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to do to introduce. Oh, uh, no, I think... I think, oh, I will say one more thing. I will say one more thing, which is the reason that I asked her to talk about this is that I remember having already experienced joy about this topic because this is a topic we have used at work informally in like social settings uh, as a, should I admit this? My, uh, yeah, my as, might as, I mean, we've, we've, used, we've used this topic as a drinking game at work. And during that process... Not during business said, hours. Not during business hours, on social retreats. Yes. We, have, we have joked that we should really share this whole experience with the world. So we're not drinking today. If you want to, I mean, I'm not going to stop you. Um, your favorite water or seltzer or other beverage. And... Um, yeah, I think that's that's all I'll say about that. Oh, one third thing, final thing. The, other, the last way in which I'm cheating is that some of this topic we will discover, instead of going under the, under the topic of, oh, that's good, really should fall under the topic of, oh, that's bad. But it gives us such pleasure to revel in how, how unfortunate it, it is. It's, it's so, cathartic. Yeah, it's cathartic. So that's, that's the full intro. But now, Siobhan. Hello. Tell me, hi, hello, hi, how, are how are you? I'm, I'm doing, I'm very happy to be talking to you. I'm so happy you. to be talking to you. Uh, and, and please tell me, share with me what we're going to be talking about today. We are going to be, well, you asked me here to talk about time code, um, mm. which this, this is going to be a, a variant of a lecture that I usually give at the beginning of the school year, every year where I teach. Uh, and it's, it's basically kind of a discussion of what time code is and why it is the way it is, um, because it's there are a lot of things about it that are not immediately obvious, um, especially to people who are using time code in kind of off-label uses, such as theatrical settings. Um, and some of them might chafe at me calling it off-label, but it really kind of is. It was designed for film and television, and um, that's, that's really where it fits the most naturally. And so sometimes people, people get tripped up when they try to use it in other ways. Um, but honestly, even people who have been using it for years in film and television get tripped up by it sometimes. So I'm going to talk a little bit, bit about why it is, but I also want to talk a little more generally about synchronization because synchronization in other contexts is what actually really does spark joy for me. Um, it's true. If I could Marie Kondo time code out of my life, I, I might be tempted to do it. Um, but not time code as a whole, though, just some of the complexities, because time code, when time code is working properly, when you've got everything set up right, it feels like magic. You can take two computers running different software and hit play on one and the other one will just follow it. And, uh, or any two machines, it doesn't even have to be computers. It can be like old school three quarter inch uh, video tape decks. Um, and, and when you can just start in one place, you can skip around and start in, at a new, at a new spot on one machine and have another machine just automatically follow it. It does kind of feel like magic at first. Uh, so, so I'm going to interrupt you yes, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll, um, I'll take a moment to pause and sort of work through what we just listened to, which is that what I'm hearing is that time code is a thing. Mm -hmm which is used in TV, 
uh, movies, sometimes theater, some, these kind of contexts. And it is used to synchronize pieces of equipment. Mm -hmm. So far, so good? So far, so good. Um, even more simply than that, time code is a way of just measuring and identifying time in the context of a, a fixed frame-based timeline, such as film and television. Um, so like, if I had a, a thing that happened at one point in a film and I wanted to really pinpoint and like write down a number that said exactly what time that is, time code would be the way that I do that. And if I, if I didn't know what time code was and had never encountered it, mm -hmm. I might say something like, well, it happens five minutes into the movie. Yeah. Go to the point five minutes in and do something at five minutes yeah. in. Yeah. And, and that might be my version of what an idea like time code. And you would be off to a great start if you did that. Okay. Um, I think that's a great place to jump into uh, the presentation. Um, okay. This is, a, this is a little ditty I like to call time code. What is it? And why does it have to hurt? Um <laughs> So this, this I haven't actually seen this exact <laughs> presentation. I've only heard the verbal version of this, so, oh. so this part is new to me. Oh, I haven't actually right. seen the visuals. Okay. So, and and it, and it has been updated a little bit over time too. Oh, good, so, good, good, yeah. good. All right. Uh, so we're going to start with a topic that I know is near and dear to you from a conversation a couple weeks ago, where you were just like, I can't wrap my brain around what is time, like this thing that passes. Yeah. How do we even like? put our fingers on what exactly it is like you can think of a timeline as just this thing like in media as a thing that just exists but mm -hmm. as this thing that's passing like how do we quant quantify that um and so my my presentation starts with the question what is time and that question is really kind of big and broad and philosophical so i like to narrow it down and talk about like well time is a thing we can measure so let's talk about the measurement. So uh, let's talk about a second. What is a second? If you ask the scientific community to define a second, they will be very happy to tell you that a second is the duration of 9,192,631,770 periods of the radiation correspond... <laughs> Little cheeky, yeah. little cheeky. <laughs> yeah, we don't use this definition, do we? No, no, nobody I know actually knows this uh, because nobody I know has one of these in their living room. Um, and that, is that a clock? That is an atomic clock. That is at an IST. Clock. Uh, and we use it all the time. This clock tells a computer what, like, how fast time is going by, and that computer mm -hmm. tells a bunch of other computers what time it is. And then those computers tell more computers, and eventually they tell our cell phones and our computers and our smartwatches uh -huh. and stuff. Um, that all comes from, so from when, this thing. So that if we were to apply the phrase, it's turtles all the way down, it's, it's really turtles all the way down until we get to the cesium. Until we get to cesium the cesium in here, or yeah. Whatever it, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, but in our daily lives, we have a much more pedestrian idea of, a, of what a second is, which is just that it is a way of subdividing a day. Um, mm -hmm. We have 60 of them in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day. That makes 86,400 seconds in a day. Um, and the reason I brought up the first definition is not because it's actually useful to us, but uh, because I want to introduce the idea that the definition of a second can vary based on context. That's something that's going to come okay. up again later. Okay, okay. Okay. So now that that's out of the way, uh, we can talk about how we measure time. You were saying, well, I might say like five minutes into a film, um, and that would be pretty similar to how we normally conceive of time, like time of day. We take hours and minutes and write them down with a colon separating the digits. Um, mm -hmm. So like four hours and 19 minutes after midnight, which is the time that we arbitrarily say is our, our zero time, uh, even though we Americans like to use 12 instead of zero, that's neither here nor there. <coughs> and we would write at 04 colon 19, and that means 419. And if we want to be a little bit more precise, we can add seconds to that. So we're just adding a couple more digits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. now if we want to do the same thing in film, let's start with film, not television, um, just because we're going historically here and, and film predates television. So in film, we might want to get down to a finer grain of precision than seconds. And the natural subdivision to use is frames, because there are 
uh, because film is a series of pictures, each of which is one frame. And when you put them all together, it looks like motion, uh, but there are actually few enough of them that we can just number them this way. Okay. So far, okay. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Within, and within, within each second, there's some number of frames. And so when we're trying to talk about a specific one of them, we need to not only have the time in the time that I think about it, uh, but the frame count within the second that I've specified. Yes. Like I, I could do that with decimal points of precision for a second. I could just say uh, 3.5683 seconds, which happens to be the third frame, but it makes more sense if I just say three seconds in the third frame in. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, however, it's about to get a little more complicated than that. Uh, okay. Because it turns out this is actually, there are a couple of reasons this is, this like after zero conception is not the most efficient use of the number space we have available. What we've done with okay. this notation is we basically defined a timeline that is a fixed thing that starts at zero and goes for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And we can narrow down to any little fraction of a second within that, within that timeline. But if we were to say uh, our film starts at zero and goes up from there until the film ends, uh, for one thing, we're not making use of very much of that timeline. We're just kind of like, nobody's working on projects that are anywhere close to 24 hours in length. Um, okay. Usually it's going to be more like an hour and a half, maybe two hours if it's really long. Um, so we're just not using a whole lot of that time uh, very efficiently. But more importantly, there are times when we want to talk about things happening before the start of the film. For sure. example, let's say in scoring, which is my background, uh, we want to record some main titles and we want the main titles to start at the very first frame of film. You want to be able to give the musicians a count off into that first beat. And if that first... So musicians, so we, we're, we're, we're creating a title sequence for a film mm -hmm. and we are composing music for it. Yes. And to... And to record the music we've composed for the title sequence of the film. We're in a room with an orchestra and they need to begin, uh, they need to coordinate their playing, synchronize their playing with what, what has been set in stone in the film, the titles, mm -hmm. and to coordinate their beginning of the music, they actually are, are, their time needs to start prior to the very first moment we see because they need to be all ready to go on that moment. Right, because you can't just tell them, okay. you can't like, there might be 80 to 100 musicians in the room and you can't just tell them, go! Uh, <laughs> it's not going to work for anyone. I mean, you could, well. but yeah. You could. You could. Let's see how, how far that Can gets you. Can you imagine? <laughs> and you, <laughs> director, he's just really good. Go! Yeah. <laughs> um, and... Actually, a, a third reason that this is not very efficient uh, is that if we think historically to a time when we're at, when film actually means film, like literal celluloid on a on a mm -hmm. reel, uh, those reels don't hold anywhere close to an hour and a half of film. They hold maybe oh. like twenty minutes or so a piece. Oh, okay. So the project is going to be divided minutes, up. Twenty minutes, not very long. Yeah, not very much. So the project is actually going to get divided up into reels. By the editors because that's the way they have to work um, and so that becomes uh, something that makes it a little bit fiddly to deal with time if we're just counting up from zero so what we do instead we take these hours places that we're not really using that much anyway and we repurpose them to be the real number so we start with real number one uh, and then we have real number two real number three uh -huh, maybe it goes uh -huh. up to real six or so uh -huh. say um, okay. And so now this, I can put a four here. It doesn't mean four hours into the film. It means the start of real four. Real four, 19 which minutes in. might be about about an hour into the film or so. All right, so so already we have this, this nice representation of time, which suddenly the numbers I'm looking at are not the time that I'm used to seeing. It's some of these numbers are time, some of these numbers are physically a reel of film, mm -hmm. uh, but they're all mashed up into one number. Okay. Now, now there is still a, a, a timeline that we still have 24 hours to work with on this fixed timeline, 
It's just mm -hmm. that we're using little discrete chunks that are spaced okay. one hour okay. apart on the timeline. Okay. Okay. Um, and if you were to look at the timeline itself as a whole, then yeah, you, our conception of seconds is still kind of what we expect. Okay. Um, and by the way, in television has a, a similar phenomenon. It's just they call it acts instead of reels. Okay. And that's typically where the commercial breaks fall is between okay. acts. Um, but they use the, the numbers in a similar way. Okay. Okay. So great. Um, this is, this is in essence what time code is. Mm -hmm. Um, there's some complexity to it, but it's not awful. Mm -hmm. Um, but we do have a little lingering question, which is how many frames are there in a second? Uh, that turned out to be something that there was some back and forth on in the early history of film. Uh, there, because there was one camp that said, we want it to look as smooth as possible, so let's do a lot of frames per second. And then mm -hmm. there was another camp that said, film is really freaking expensive, let's not use too many frames per second. And oh, so sure. we finally ended up in a, a compromise. Um, and at the moment, I'm just talking about in the US, okay. uh, which is 24 frames per second. And this is so this was back in like the early 1900s that this was decided or when was that uh this was in like the 19 teens to 1920s i believe uh, okay i i don't know see. exactly when this became like set in stone standardized mm -hmm. uh, but i know that there were a lot of this back and forth was happening in the in the teens uh, okay about like do we want to do 18 or 30 or what do we want what do we want to end up with um, okay. Apparently, thirty looked really nice, uh, but yeah, film was insanely expensive. So, mm. twenty-four frames per second is what we have in the U.S., and that was pretty easy to uh, engineer equipment around because we have this AC power on the walls that runs at sixty hertz, and the mathematical relationship between sixty and twenty-four is pretty easy to build some gears around and and just drive the frame rate frame rate that way. Oh, because they need it. They, I mean, when they're inventing all of this stuff from scratch, if you're doing 24 frames a second, you need to be able to physically move film yeah. exactly 24 frames a second and they, through a machine. And they don't have, have quartz electricity. crystal oscillators yeah. at this point. So if, okay, so they're, so they're doing some, they have some real engineering things they need to be thinking about to, to, to say if it's, if it's okay <laughs> yeah okay it's not just like i'm so used to living inside a computer where yeah. i just pick whatever thing i want to think about and and the computer does what i tell it to i don't have to think about physical quartz crystals or electricity or anything like that right, but, right. um okay. but yeah and for for the people who are engineering this sort of thing it became there was a, a little complication there because 24 frames per second worked great here but over in Europe, they don't use 60 hertz for their power. They use 50 hertz. And okay. that's that's not as clean a mathematical relationship. So they ended up using a slightly different standard. <clears throat> they went with 25 frames per second. Okay. All right. I simplified this here to U.S. versus elsewhere. There are some other countries that follow the U.S. Um, but for the most part, this is like in the early history, this is just kind of American exceptionalism that keeps us doing stuff different from from everybody else okay so far so good we've got two different standards which isn't ideal but we at least know, know how to work with this right yeah okay so in 19 and don't send your film to the other i mean you, no international releases unless you're I mean, willing to have them like either go through some sort of expensive conversion process or maybe play back a little bit too fast yeah okay <laughs> okay all right Okay, so 1941, the National Television Systems Committee convenes to talk about television, um, which is very exciting. Uh, television is, is, a, is a, a big deal. Um, unfortunately, if you build a cathode ray tube and try to display an image on it at 24 frames per second, it, is, it looks like garbage, and it might, like... Uh, trigger people with photosensitivities. Uh, it's just so flickery 
because oh. a cathode ray tube doesn't actually illuminate the whole screen for uh. a prolonged period of time the way a film projector does. Um, so okay. So they had so to. We got to go faster. We got to go faster. So they decide let's go with thirty frames per second because we can actually do a pretty simple ish uh, conversion from twenty four to thirty, um, <laughs> which is actually taking advantage of the fact that this. When we talk about 30 frames per second, in television, frames are, are subdivided further into fields. So there's the scan line of the CRT goes down one field and then back up the next field, and that's one frame. Okay. And you can take advantage of that to do this process called telecine that converts 24 to 30. And, and this is, when you say television, we're talking about original television. Original, black and white giant sets um yeah yeah so at every step so far we've had to accommodate the physical reality of the thing we're watching to to decide how fast like how regularly can that thing update how fast does it need to update so we don't have seizures <laughs> uh i mean all of these these physical constraints that decide how many frames we fit into each second, and therefore what our numbering system for that medium is going to be. Yep. Yep, yep. Okay. Um, now, this is just in the U.S., by the way, NITSI television. Of course. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. People in the rest of the world want television, too, so what are they going to do? They have to come up with their own standard, which they called PAL. I don't remember what it stands for, P-A-L. Um, it turns out 25 works fine for them. Oh. So they good didn't have for to, them. they didn't, good for them, yes. They didn't have to deal with any conversion at all. Okay. Uh, they, it is still divided into fields, so it's 50 fields per second, but, you know, just one frame becomes one frame and it's fine. We don't have to do this thing where we've got four frames becoming five frames and, uh -huh, and all that. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay, so right. here's, here's just right. a little illustration. I mean, I'm conceptually with you so far. Yeah, this, this is a little illustration of why that like uh, persistence of vision thing happens that required us to use something other than 24. So this is a film projector in slow motion. And you can see the light coming through the shutter is on a little over half the time. And uh -huh. whenever that light is on, the full image is illuminated on the screen. So... There is some flicker, but it's not too much because there's light coming into your eyes at least half the time on every uh -huh. different part of of the image. I've never seen this in slow motion. By contrast, I don't know. I don't know why yeah. I didn't imagine it being an irregular feed. I just I imagined film just sort of smoothly going through, but that looked like there was sort of a oh yeah, it goes through one one frame at a time. The, it illuminates for a while. <laughs> And then the shutter closes, it advances to the next frame, and then it, the shutter opens and it illuminates for a it while. It makes sense, but I never thought about it. I just imagined it smoothly. Yeah. Cool. All right. Okay. Um, the reels are turning smoothly, but the film actually in front of the, the shutter has to do this little <laughs> dance. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Which is where that sound must come from that I associate with old film. Yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> That's why that is. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, so by contrast, here's a cathode ray tube television in super slow motion. You can see the scan line going across the screen, and it's illuminating mm. the phosphor on the, the front of the screen. And as it goes, it builds up this image. But at any given time, most of, most of the frame <laughs> is black. Most of it's black. There's actually just a little bit of light hitting your eyes at any given point in time. And if you do this fast enough, persistence of vision will carry it over and it will look fine, but 24 frames per second isn't fast enough for that. I, I, in one of the previous conversations, I talked with someone about uh, mediated reality. We were talking about hearing yeah. and about how what we hear is not what we're, what we think we hear is not what we actually hear. And what a great example of what we think we see is not what we actually see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that's just that's why we have these two different standards. But okay, we have three different standards if we're counting film in the U.S., television in the U.S., film and television elsewhere, right? 
Which is not okay. ideal. Yeah, because elsewhere, it's the same frames per second. Yes. So we managed to limit it to no more than three different <laughs> no standards. More than three. Yet. No more than three. Uh, <laughs> okay. Because barely a decade and a half or so passed before they opened Pandora's box. In the form of Close it again. color television. Uh, oh, so this is black and white so far. Black and We're white only so far, yeah. Black and white television. Yeah. Twenty. F- how many frames per second in black and white? Thirty. Thirty. Thirty frames per second. Thirty frames per second mm-hmm. in black and white. Okay. Why didn't they keep that? <laughs> well, I will tell you. <laughs> because here's how television works. Um, in a black and white television broadcast, you've got this luminance signal. That's these pixels going across the uh, across the scan line down the screen. Uh, that gets modulated into an FM signal that's transmitted. That's the main uh, main carrier of the television broadcast. There's also a subcarrier for the audio because you don't want to have a television broadcast that's just silent most of the time. That would be pretty... I don't know. Maybe it wouldn't be boring. Not... It would make you use your imagination. Uh... <laughs> If you had a good musician at home who could do like an old school yes. silent Ragtime movie piano. on the organ or piano. Yes. Like, da, da, da. Yeah. yeah. So how are we going to add color to this without making people's incredibly expensive television sets that they've only had for a few years obsolete? Oh. Because this, this uh, color in television... We're used to thinking of it as broken down into red, green, and blue, which Mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. But if you were to just have the black and white television show the red signal or just the green signal, it wouldn't look right. No. Yeah. Yeah. So what they do instead is they use luminance and chrominance. So they transform the color information from red, green, blue to, uh, to these three different channels, YCBCR or YUV, uh, which is the luminance is essentially the black and white version of the image. How bright, how bright any particular spot on the TV needs to be. Mm-hmm. I, I at least understand that. Yes. Okay. And then there are two chrominance channels as well. One which is essentially how blue-ish that pixel is, and one that's how red-ish that pixel is. And Okay. If you put that data together, you can transform it back to RGB on the other end. So you can send just the bluish and just the reddish and somehow get the greenish out of it as well? You get the, the green. So human eyes are more sensitive to the green part of the spectrum. So green is closer to uh, the to the luminance signal to begin with. Oh, so we kind of so the so the luminance is it's not exactly like what we would see as if we were just were reviewing this as RGB encoded, mm-hmm. it wouldn't be the green channel, but no. it would be cl- a lot closer to the green. It channel. has a higher uh, contribution from the green component than it does from red and blue. So, okay. So we just to appreciate what's happening here for a second, we have, we have a third generation technology. We started with film that's, that's black and white and, light is going through it some number of times a second. We limited the amount of times because of the cost of the film. We went to TV, which is being driven by electricity at a certain uh, hertz out of the wall and therefore needs to be a slightly different number of frames per second, which is also black and white. And then we went to color and because not only of the history of the black and white television, which we don't want to obsolete, but also the physical reaction of eyes, human eyes to light. Uh, we now have that set of constraints that we're using to decide how to transmit color TV information. And therefore I'm sensing a conclusion that involves the frames per second. <gasps> how did you know? I just had a sense. I just had a feeling that's where we were going. So here's the thing. When they're researching and doing their R&D for colored television in the 1950s, they, uh, somebody, uh, I think it was at GE, was doing some work on some test equipment and discovered that, so that we, backing up a second, I was talking about okay. there's the luminance signal and then an audio subcarrier. 
they keep those and then they add a chrominance subcarrier. So it just adds okay. the color information for people who have okay. extra fancy new color sets. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And it still works for people Reasonable. who don't. Um, okay. But if you're making your equipment cheaply enough, which of course they want to do, um, this new <laughs> chroma subcarrier interferes with the audio subcarrier in a way that produces visual artifacts when there's sound. Oh, no. Oh no! Okay. Oh, that's okay. Bad. So we're adding a whole another physical constraint yes. here. Yes, yes, we are. Okay. This is now an, okay. an electromagnetic constraint. <laughs> okay. And okay. So, this clever engineer. Uh, this is. I think I saw it attributed to GE. I'm not sure. I don't want to cast too much blame, uh, but they came up with this really, really elegant, clever solution, which is, if you just slow it down a tiny bit, just a tiny bit, just 0.1 percent. Um then that breaks the relationship in such a way that the subcarriers don't interfere with each other. And the signal looks great. Picture looks great. Sound sounds great. Everything's hunky-dory. 0.1% is such a tiny difference. Who's going to notice, right? And this is across the whole... This is both the audio and the video things are slowed down, or is it just one? The whole thing gets gets slowed down. The audio is analog, so uh, it's it's... If you slow it down by 0.1%, it's basically yeah. not noticeable in the moment. Um, so something about the electromagnetic math of how this is being translated, trans, transmitted in frequency modulated radio waves, mm -hmm. something about that, a smart person figured out that although if we sent it at the frequencies we were, it's gonna interfere with each other if we just slow the content down and send it at a just slightly slower, mm -hmm. it'll remove that noise. Now there's a little bit of controversy around this. Okay. Because it's not super well documented how much of a problem this was and how much this solution fixed it. Um, this is just what kind of the oral history of, okay. of television standards tells us. But someone, somewhere along someone, the line, yeah. the thought there was some important reason due to perhaps fancy math that I don't understand, mm -hmm. but which we will believe yes. exists, uh, to, they, were, they thought it would solve them a problem to slow the whole thing down by this tiny amount that no one would notice. Yeah, exactly. And so now we have a new frame so rate. So now I have a color TV. And our and color a TV. a different rate! is essentially 29.97 frames per second. Now, see, I don't like that number. <laughs> it's not a nice, clean number, is it? No. I, I mean, what is, it, w before I could understand there was 30 frames in a second, and if I want to talk to you about frame 25 or tra frame 30, I can imagine that, that timeline in my head. I just go, with this, I don't know what that means. <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. 20, yeah, <laughs> 20 exactly. Thank you. I'm uh, anticipating your next slide. Okay, please continue. <laughs> okay, so yeah, just like you were saying, if we're going from 24 to 30, we're still talking about seconds. You know, seconds still has a, a meaningful definition to us. It's just we have to convert from four frames of film into five frames of video, which is annoying, but we can do it. Going from 30 to 29.97 is not the same thing. It's actually slowing the, slowing the playback down. Uh, so we're talking about the same number of frames. If we have a black and white video and we want to play it back on a colored TV, it's still going to be like every four frames. It's still going to be four frames. They're just going to take a tiny bit longer to play back. And this introduces uh -huh. the concept of speed. We now have video speed and film speed. It's not the same thing as frame rate. It's a related concept, but right. Video speed is slightly slower than film speed, and that applies to because because I mean because if we're talking about synchronization here, mm -hmm. I have if I'm operating. Let me see if I can repeat this back to you, because the whole deal is I'm I have a number, I have an encoding, I have a time code which tells you where in time something is sorta, and in film speed. If I, I can, it, which has the exact same number of frames as video speed. So if I count the number of frames 
If, let's just, just talk about frames for a second. Let's yeah. say I count 1,000 frames into it. Both of them are going to have the, the exact same frame at that moment in, in, the, in the media, but the time at which that frame is shown yes. is going to be different. Yes. Because one of them is playing back fast, a little bit faster than the other. So I, if I'm talking about synchronizing those two things, right. I need this new you, piece of information to tell me which world I'm living exactly. in. Exactly. You need to know whether you're at 29.97 or 30. And so this brings us back to our oh. original question, what is a second? And now the, answer, now the answer is, what do you mean by a second? <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. So, oh, that's bad. <laughs> oh, that's bad. At twenty nine point nine seven frames per second, here's the thing: um, this a time code duration that looks like this is not one second. Mm -hmm. It is one point zero zero one seconds. It feels like a, at when operating at twenty nine point nine seven frames per second. Yeah, and it feels like a tiny difference when you put it this way, but when it when you start to add it up. A duration like this is not one hour, it's one hour and 3.6 seconds. See, now just now, now, it's, now you're frustrating me, Siobhan. Because yes. you're telling me that one second isn't one second. Okay, okay. all right. Okay, so yeah, this, this makes it hard for us to measure durations because it used to be we could just look at the time code and see like more or less what time things happened and we had some extra things to account for, but it, was, it made sense. And I mean, in all that. seriousness, in all seriousness, we have now moved solidly into a world in which me telling you a time code is not the same thing as me telling you what I think of as time. Yet again, I'm you... I'm telling you a thing... Wait, I'm telling you a thing that looks like time and is very close to what I think of as, like, time, right? Yeah. But it's no longer time yeah. anymore. Okay. Or put another way, time code is now just frame labels, not actual time. Oh! <laughs> I'm sorry. I should <laughs> let you. I should stop interrupting you. Oh no, it's you. great. I love it. I should let you. I love it. I love what it. this means is you're teaching me well because I'm I'm on the ride with you exactly where you want me to be. <laughs> okay, great. All right. So, <laughs> so what do we do if we're running a television broadcast and we need to sell ad time and we want to make sure that we're not cutting one of our advertisers short by three point six seconds? Because <laughs> we'd hate to do that. We would yes, hate to ahead. do that. They would be pretty pretty unhappy with us. So in order to make things easier on ourselves, um, <laughs> we need a way to talk about time code in a way that looks more like the actual time, the elapsed time that we're talking about. And so we introduce, not a new frame rate, don't worry, no more frame rates. I'm done. Okay. I'm done. Okay. But we do have a new counting system, which we're going to call, oh. which is very, very <laughs> unfortunately named drop frame it does not involve dropping any frames <laughs> so let's call it drop frame if yeah it doesn't exactly involve exactly. doing that uh, sure what what it does involve is this simple rule skip the first two frames of each minute that is not divisible by 10 right that's clear enough right uh, I'm sorry wait I'm gonna <laughs> I need a, I need a second skip the first two frames of each minute that is not divisible. <laughs> so you can think of this a little bit analogously to leap years and leap days. Um, okay. in, a, in a leap year, we add a 29th day of February to every year that is divisible by, by four, but not by 200, mm. I think was the rule. Mm. Um, so we- And this is, the purpose of this is to make the time code the numbers that we see in the time code look more like the time that we think of them as? Yes, exactly. So here's, okay. here's an example. If, this is, if we have this frame, at the next frame in picture, we're not going to call it this. We're not going to call it this. We're going to call it this. We skip straight to zero two. And, and then all of this is because four. somebody wanted to make TV sets cheaper. Apparently, yeah. So we skip these two frames of time code, not the actual frames of picture. We're not dropping any frames. Uh, we just skip these two numbers and go to this number. We skip these two numbers and go to this number. We don't skip these two numbers because 20 is divisible by 10. Okay. And someone figured this out because it just, it, they just figured out how many frames they needed to drop in this particular formulation drop. Yeah. The, how many frames they needed to skip a number, uh, skip a label for. Mm -hmm. And this comes up with the right number. Yeah. Because over the course of an hour of time code, at 
uh, at 30 frames per second, that's 108,000 frames. And that means that we are, if we are moving to 29.97 frames per second, that's a 0.1% difference. So we're losing 108 frames. And so uh, they just kind of divide that up in a way that kind of distributes the change fairly evenly-ish across that hour. And that's how it works out. It's, it is kind of analogous to, to, uh, to leap days. I think it's just, you know, we're yeah, not, I, I, we're, we're more used to that rule than this one. That makes sense. But we can look at this a little bit visually. So let's take a moment, <laughs> take a breath. Let's take a moment, let's take a moment. Okay. So here I have a bunch of frames uh, that are in sequence. So time is going this way, advancing. Um, and I have labeled them with the time code for each frame. And this is about four minutes into the reel, even though it says the end. I've, I've concocted a fake reel here that's only about four minutes long. Um, and so this, this line represents exactly four minutes of elapsed playback time, uh, or, or wall clock time, we can call it. What I think of as time. Yeah. Um, if we were at 30 frames per second, this would be exactly what time code shows us four minutes into real one. At 29.97 frames per second, we've drifted by 7.2 frames over the course of those four minutes. And so our uh, our 104 is off here past the edge of the screen. The, uh. the first frame of this card that says the end is 103.59.27. And here it's still 103.59.27. This is our original 29.97, not drop uh. frame. If we were to do this in drop frame instead to try to compensate the numbers uh, for this drift, we would uh -huh. leave these frames in place because we're not dropping any frames. And we would just take the numbers away and we would replace them uh -huh. with a new set of numbers that look new like this. New numbers. This is true. And that, that new set of numbers is closer to what the wall clock time. It is closer. So here we see uh, 103.59.29. 104 0002. Uh -huh. So our four minute mark by time code looks like it's somewhere around here, which is a lot closer to where it is. It's, not, it's not the same not though. The same, it's just a lot closer. But it will never be more than two frames off. Well, that's about the best we can that. do. Um, All right. And when I was when I was starting in scoring, this was uh, I. I was assisting a composer who was working at that point pretty much entirely in film. And uh, the way the studios distributed film to the people who were working in post-production, they QuickTime existed, was well established by this point, but they were so worried about piracy that they wouldn't give you a QuickTime movie to work with. They would give you mm. VHS tapes. And a VHS tape being color video is a 29.97 frames per second. But the film you're working on is a 24 frames per second. No. And we would not use drop frame for this stuff. So that, that complication isn't in there. But you would have to do things like, you would have to know that you're working at video speed in your studio, but by the time it goes to the dub stage where it's going to get mixed in with the other audio channels into the, into the soundtrack, it's going to be pulled back up 0.1% to film speed. <sighs> Okay. So if you, I mean, so and that yeah. affects musical tempo and things. Uh, if you were yeah at 120 beats per minute, it's going to get pulled up to 120.12 beats per minute. That probably doesn't matter. Or is it 100? <laughs> yeah, I think it's that. Yeah. I mean, I don't Who know a know lot about difference? music, Who? but I don't think the time I mean matters a lot. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, one of one of my formative experiences of effing things up uh, was on a scoring session that I had helped prepare the materials for uh, so on the scoring stage there was the Pro Tools rig that was doing all the playback with the pre-recorded audio and recording all the musicians there was also an Oracle rig which was a separate computer running separate software over timecode <clears throat> and Pro Tools is like is music software. Pro Tools is yeah like audio recording. audio recording and manipulation. Mm -hmm. um, 
And Oracle is this very specialized uh, software for uh, running, uh, among other things, clicks. And it was generating the clicks. But and what's a click? A click is basically like a metronome. Uh, it's, okay. And the musicians can hear it in their earphones, um, but it doesn't go onto the onto the mix. Uh, it's not out in the air. So, uh, so Oracle was generating clicks for the musicians to listen to listen to, and totally separately from that, just synchronized by time code, there was Pro Tools playing back all this pre-recorded audio, and they would drift by zero point one percent over the course of the queue. Oh, and the Oracle no. operator had to like pull me aside and be like. Were you working at video speed? And oh, no, because this is the kind of thing that you would only notice it w after a lot of damage had already been done. You're not going to start both tracks and be like, these are not, these are off. You're only going to notice it minutes into the process. Yeah, um, potentially. Yeah. He, the, the way that he would work, he had a, um, he had a machine that would... There were also clicks coming from Pro Tools. They just didn't use those clicks. I'm not really sure why. Um, they okay. used clicks coming from Oracle instead. And he had a machine that could compare the two and would show the drift before it became too oh. too noticeable. And so he jumped because, right in and, and slowed it down. Because so many people had made this mistake. Yeah. They needed a special they needed a special process <laughs> to catch whether it was happening. Yeah. Otherwise you're paying a room full of people for like fifteen minutes of playing that you can't use. Yeah. <laughs> a room full of very expensive union musicians. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Great. You don't, you don't and by great, musicians. I mean horrifying. Yeah. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> oh, that's bad. <laughs> okay. 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 We're almost done. Don't worry. All right. We're almost and done. Uh, uh, this whole time, we've just been wanting to have a way to say a number that looks like a time that lets us synchronize two things that are flowing through time mm -hmm. that's all we want mm -hmm. but through this steady accretion of historical technical, technical constraints debt. and technical debt we now have i don't i've lost count of how many versions of this number we have <laughs> well that's... that play at different speeds so there's yeah epilogue yeah maybe epilogue. you're about to you're let's, about to let's let's take stock let's, of where we let's are let's take stock please. <laughs> please okay so here's here's our collection here's our menagerie <laughs> of frame rates oh we have 24 we have 25 we have 29.97 drop frame we have 29.97 non-drop frame and we have 30 um there are some products in which you will see 30 <clears throat> drop frame that this is the Higgs boson of frame rates. It <laughs> is predicted by the theory, but is never seen in the wild. <laughs> because because there's no reason to use drop frame if you're already at thirty, because it's already at, at film speed. It already yeah. lines up with your expectation of time. So if you see that, be concerned. Yes, be concerned. Be and run, don't use it. Run for the hills. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I Chris. Chris, hmm. I told you a lie before. Oh no! I have more frame no. rates for you. No! 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 <laughs> because it turns what out. Are those? <laughs> What's that nonsense? It turns out that sometimes it's actually useful to have video speed versions of twenty-four and twenty-five. <sighs> These get used in, uh, like, uh, DVD and Blu-ray releases of theatrical content that is meant for U.S. televisions. Because you don't want to have to store I wish, 30 frames I wish when had, you can store 24. I wish we had some, like, empty martini glasses <laughs> to point together. <laughs> or full, frankly. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, but now I'm done for real. Okay, that, that's, okay. That's, that's all so, the frames. So, whenever uh, we want to synchronize two two things in time, all we need to do <laughs> is make sure we know which of these 
uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven possible very similar looking numeric languages we are talking. Yes. Um, Some of which are so similar that you can, the numbers are all exactly the same. It's just the speed at which you see them is different. Yeah. So, and this, by the way, everything that I've talked about so far, aside from these two, this is all stuff that develops over the course of like maybe 40 years. This is, mm -hmm. It's really fast paced from film to black and white television to color television. There's not a whole lot of time in between. And then there's this kind of long period from 1957, I think was color TV, something like that, um, up through 2005 when the Advanced Television Systems Committee, it basically, NITSI reconvenes to talk about digital television. And here's the thing about digital television. It is not mm -hmm. subject to any of this technical debt that we talked about. We don't have cathode ray tubes doing scan lines down the screen right. and back up. We've got, by this point, we've right. got LEDs, we've got plasma, and mm -hmm. we've got things that are going at really high refresh rates mm -hmm. that don't have to be driven by the, the broadcast signal. 60 frames per second. You can make everything 60 frames per second. You could make, you know, uh, you, you could just standardize and you could say if you really want that like lower frame rate look you can make something at a lower frame rate but still broadcast it at 60 frames per second mm -hmm. we have we had ATSC had this one chance to destroy evil forever but I, I'm getting the sense that they did not they, <laughs> what is that? Who they, is that? they left Mordor with the ring <laughs> Oh, uh, it's a slightly outdated reference at this point, but I but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> they decided to keep all this nonsense. Oh, so all these frame rates still exist. And they did not throw it into the. They did not fires cast it into the pits. Of, yes. Oh. So that's time code. Wow! Wow! Yeah. Um, oh, Siobhan, <laughs> that's bad. But but. All that bad stuff, all all this nonsense, nonsense. I'm hitting my computer. I'm so annoyed with it. <clears throat> is really just configuration details, because right. once you get the two ends agreeing on what flavor yeah. of time code you're using, it you're good. it does kind of work like magic. And yeah, um, at least at first, to me, the magic kind of palls after a little while because just getting two computers to do the same thing at the same time is it's a little mundane um to me the much the thing that really sparks joy is when you go beyond just synchronizing a machine to a machine and you bring humans in and you get a room full of 80 to 100 musicians and have them playing in perfect sync to picture that's a totally different totally different uh, mm -hmm. concern mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so you have to hire musicians who have studied seven different forms of time code exactly and you and just feed them time code into their headphones and they <laughs> <laughs> done we're done here done no um th this is this is the part that i'm i'm really excited but the oh that's good part like this is okay, the part that's okay. joy for me um <sighs> yes i'm We'll just kind of let out all, let all that history go. of time code. Yes, I'm now ready. Okay, so that's when I was first uh, getting started in scoring. I was kind of expecting that what would happen is you would write some music, and you would have some sense of your timings, and you would just write the music, and you would take it to the studio and record it, and then sync it up to picture afterwards. It turns out that's not how you normally work. You, it is very valuable to be able to see the picture on the screen while you're recording. So the way that we actually work is basically watching the movie while the musicians are out there playing in perfect sync with the movie that we're watching in the next room over. And to me, that's what feels really magical. And mm. so the, if we think about ways that you can make this happen, um, let's 
go back in time again to a time before uh, to a time before even click tracks existed. We had no way okay. to, um, you know, for because this was would this be before there were like was it before head headphones or even before you could generate a click track? I guess because you yeah. have to be able to create a tr- click track, yeah. so we, which we, we can, can do easily with the computer. Yeah, but. click tracks yeah. work great on the computer, um, and they're okay. So let's not go back in time yet. Let's talk about click tracks for a second. Um, okay, okay. there you can make a comp- make a computerized click track, which can actually pre- be pretty sophisticated. It can follow the tempo changes, it can follow the meter changes, you can do patterns. So if you're in a really fast um, odd meter, like like if there are seven beats to the measure and it's really fast, you might you might you might not want to follow a click that goes like that. You might want something mm. like <laughs> and you can do that sort of thing in software. It's more mm-hmm. sophisticated than, than a metronome. Uh, you can have the click drop out. You can have it come back in with free clicks mm-hmm. at a new tempo. You can do all this stuff. Um, before computers, you really couldn't do that very easily. Uh, what you could do is there is it, was a company called Yuri, the, un, what is it? Universal Recording Engineering. In, I forget exactly what it stands for. But anyway, it's the company that, has since been reincorporated and is now called Universal Audio. Um, hmm. They came up with this metronome that was a box that had these little uh, these little knobs on the front that you would use to set the tempo, and it would spit out this click on an audio channel that could then go to the musicians. Hmm. And it's great. Cool. It can only do one tempo, so you can't, right. you know, it's not very flexible. Um, but it was very, it was very useful for a lot of kind of engineering related reasons the click that it made uh, was not pitched so it didn't distract the musicians Uh, it was easy for the musicians to crank the volume up on their headphones because they have their own volume controls uh, Mm -hmm. without it bleeding too much out of the headphones and into the microphones which is a real concern yeah Um, and for people who are really into the electrical engineering side it has a net zero bias it has as much positive signal as negative signal over time um, and so for for all these reasons it became the standard click for film scoring and it, the same sound is used today even though we don't use those boxes oh um, interesting so, so I, we the sound that that process made became associated with what i should hear for a click yeah huh. and and so like when i'm building a click track in Pro Tools for, for a queue, I will use a little recording of that Yuri click and oh, just fun. like build the click track out of that. Oh, fun. Yeah, it's, it's really neat. And a, uh, a lot of studios have a, a new little machine now called a click kicker that takes an audio input and has an audio output and it listens for a click track coming in and it will spit out a nice, clean, uniformly leveled Yuri click on the other side. So, Wait, it'll transform your garbage click yes. into the universal standard Yuri click. As long as your click isn't too garbage. Because if you try to uh, feed it a cowbell or something, it's going to get real confused. <laughs> it's looking for impulses. But if you give it something reasonable, oh, that's, yeah. It, that's really funny. That's, I mean, people want that click so much. Is that why that box exists? Yes, yeah, because it's so useful. If you try to give musicians a beef track, which is the default in Pro Tools, uh. It's pitched. They can't. It's gonna oh. clash with whatever they're like listening to and playing. Yeah. Okay. So um, it's really helpful to have that yeah. specific. And if you give them a cowbell, then it's gonna bleed out the headphones and get picked up. And if you've got this yeah. like lush lyrical violin session section doing uh-huh. this like really delicate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> More cowbell. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. You joke, but I've been there. <laughs> so. That's click tracks. A click track is just a, a recording of something metronome-ish. But if you start it at the right time code, you can have the musicians follow it, and they'll be synced to picture. To me, that's a little bit boring uh, still, because there's, first of all, there's not a lot of room for the tempo to breathe. It's going to be really metronomic and robotic. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also, the musicians can't really listen to each other as effective as mm. they might otherwise. Um, mm. because they're listening to these clicks. If you can find a way mm. 
to work without clicks and still have the musicians mm. sync up to picture, then they can really listen to each other. Then the musicality really comes out. Um, and right, right. And also there was a time when you couldn't build a click track. So what would you do? Well. So going even further back in time, before computers, before this box that could make these clicks, we couldn't even really make clicks. Yeah. Except through a cowbell, which you would record, you would hear. Yeah. And so there was basically no way to give the musicians something audible. The only thing okay. you could do is give them something visible. Okay. So let's okay. say I've got my strip of film here, and this frame is a hit point, something that I want to, that I want to land right on musically. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't know how easily you can see this, but one of the things you can do is, this would be the music editor's job, take a working copy of the film, don't do this with the original, but take a working copy, take a hole punch, literally a hole punch, and punch a hole in the middle of a frame like this, and it makes a white circle, because when that frame comes through, the light is just going straight through unimpeded. <laughs> yeah. And so it just looks like a little visual pop on the screen. Pop. Yeah. And you can do that at regular intervals to get to get some semblance of the beat coming visual in visually. Track. Yeah. For the conductor to follow, and then the musicians follow the conductor. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and because of this, the way that we... The way that film composers talked about tempo for a long time was different from the way that uh, classical musicians talk about tempo because we're most people are used to talking about beats per minute but because the music editor has to do uh, figure out where to punch holes on these different frames they would instead measure tempo in frames and subframes like they would have uh... down to the eighth of a frame so instead of 120 beats per minute, they would say 12-0, which means there are 12 frames between each uh, click at 24 frames per second. Uh -huh. So they do that, rounding to the nearest frame, and they punch holes, and then that would be the visual click track, essentially. Man, don't get that hole wrong. Don't get it, and, and it would happen. You would have mistakes <laughs> that you have to correct, and they had they had tools for doing that. You could like tape the little thing back in place or something. <laughs> I, I think you would probably just block the whole frame off, yeah, so that sure. it just okay. dips to black. <clears throat> okay, yeah. Um, and this is really useful, but it doesn't give us a lot of warning. Um, it's it can be useful to oh sure like this is another like go <clears throat> situation. Mm. Yeah. We don't want to do that. <laughs> Uh, we want the conductor to be able to like raise the baton and have the musicians start paying attention before that first click mm -hmm. comes. Mm -hmm. So what music editors would do in a situation like that is they would lay the lay the film out and take a, something akin to a yardstick, basically, and lay it diagonally across the film and and scrape off the emulsion layer in a diagonal <gasps> line. Look at that magic. <laughs> uh huh. They would scrape off the emulsion layer in a diagonal line. It would be very steep, so it's almost vertical. Um, but it would, as you feed this through, it's going to advance from one side of the frame to the next. And oh. this place where you punch a hole is called a punch, and this diagonal line is called a streamer. And when you when you feed this film through the projector, you get something that looks like this. There's the streamer going across and punch. punch. The second it hits the the instant it hits the the right side of the screen, that's. Oh, so you, so this vert this seemingly vertical or almost vertical line, is giving you this this lead up of however many seconds that ends up being. Uh -huh. Say, and we're coming, we're coming, we're coming, land. Yeah, and it turns out yeah. that a, a three foot long streamer takes two seconds to go by. Uh, and huh. if you want a little bit more time, you can do a four foot or a five foot, which would be two and two thirds seconds or three and one third second. Um, so feet started to be a uh, an exchange rate for time. Yes, feet is a unit of time in film scoring. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <All right. laughs> because why right. not? Because why not? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, even just two seconds is enough to give you like a good, you know, there's a warning sure. coming across, and 1, boom. 000, pop. That's cool. 
And if Very you cool. with these building blocks, you can uh, you can make some pretty sophisticated things over time. You this gets translated to video uh, technology, and then later to software. And you can add color to it, um, so you can color code your streamers. You can color code your punches. Um, mm. And it's not just scoring. This gets used in ADR, which is where you replace the dialogue uh, after the fact mm -hmm. if you don't get a clean recording. Um, mm. And Foley, which is where you make like sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> so still today, when they're making movies, if they have a live orchestra, if they're, if, if they're recording with a live orchestra, which I guess only the, the fanciest movies might still do, but... Um, if they're doing that, or if you have an actor coming into a studio to to dub over the lines that didn't quite work out on set, mm -hmm. we're going to see these things that are an artifact of no longer created by taking a grease pencil or, or scratching out film, but are directly come from scratching out film and punching an actual hole in film. We're going to see something that looks very much like those being projected yep. in that studio yeah. for them to... To say this coffee is too hot at the right time <laughs> exactly <laughs> whatever whatever it is i don't know huh yeah. and time code does factor into this too you because if you have a have a machine that's generating these streamers and punches on the video um, it's going to be listening for time code that's coming from the machine uh -huh. that's recording the sound uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, so it, it factors in too but it's it's all kind of working together i just feel like wow. to me the like getting people like a, a person who is specially trained to watch these visual cues and translate them into the arm motions that then this other group of people can watch and then yeah. the net effect of which is that i'm sitting here in my herman miller Aeron chair just watching a movie while this live orchestra yeah. plays alongside it and yeah that's so cool and and how neat that the that the way, the best way still to do that comes from taking a hole punch yeah. to <laughs> film. And that we didn't, you know, all the, all the fancy stuff we can do with clicks didn't end up being better than just being able to keep the humans together with that cue coordinated through a conductor. Yeah. I mean, it's it's better in some circumstances because like you were saying, it's really only the fancy schmancy people who get to record with an orchestra mm. and just an orchestra. Um, mm. There's a lot of scoring that happens with smaller ensembles that are sweetening uh, some mm. pre-recorded synth stuff. Mm. Uh, that's really by far the more common scenario. And if you have stuff that's pre-recorded, then you kind of have to have clicks because you need it to be mm. robotically following what you sure, what you pre recorded. Sure, sure. Um, yeah. Makes but sense. if you can, but if you can cast that aside and just work visually, so the, the the orchestra is like really listening to each other, it's it's an amazing feeling to to watch that come uh, together. Yeah. Oh, I bet I want to be in the room someday to experience that. Yeah. Maybe maybe if I come visit you, you could sneak me in the room somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I would love that. Thank you for sharing this with me, um, Siobhan. Thank you for chatting with me. It's it a pleasure to relive. <laughs> parts of this and a pleasure to learn new things that I hadn't actually known before. I really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you. And thank you for the catharsis. <laughs> You're very welcome. You're very welcome. May, may the world enjoy the catharsis as well. I, I hope so. I look forward to receiving lots of letters. Uh, oh no. What are we, what are we doing? It, we know it's useful. It's just as painful for people who have to implement this stuff in software, which is mm -hmm. her and me. Mm -hmm. All of that detail is and making sure people pick the right thing, and so that there's. I mean, that's the stuff. That's the stuff that's painful yeah. when all people want to do is synchronize stuff. But yes, yeah. yes, it's and it all has a reason for being the way it is. It's just yeah, right, right. It's just historical. Right. Yeah, all of it. Every step made sense in the context that was in except possibly the the new tv commission that didn't drop the ring into yeah. the fires of mordor yeah. but i'm sure whatever. they had their reasons i'm sure and i'm sure they were good and, and if you know what they are leave them in the comments section yeah <laughs> or don't <laughs>
or don't. <laughs> I've, I've done my catharsis. I don't need any more information. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Siobhan. Thank you, Chris.